Welcome back to M.L. Miller Frights, part of the Kings of Horror Network. I'm M.L. Miller, and it's time for another low-budget binge. I've got another grouping of horror films for you this time around. Sometimes there's a lot of great indie horror to share, and sometimes there's a week like this one. This is one of those weeks where you've got to sift through a whole lot of bad to get to the good. So let's start sifting, shall we? By the way, I tweaked that logo again. Looking sharp, logo. On with the reviews. These first three films are available on demand and for digital download. Driven is a new film written, produced, and starring Casey Dillard as an Uber driver slash amateur stand-up comedian who picks up a ride that ends up changing her life forever. Don't let the poster fool you. This one only has a skosh of horror and is mostly a relational comedy. The comedy itself is hit and miss, mainly because Emerson, played by Dillard, has this snide, judgmental delivery that you usually find in stand-up comedians. Kind of a nasally, Jerry Seinfeld sort of way of speaking about a common subject that connects the comedian with the audience while it elevates both of them above the subject matter. Emerson seems to be talking into her phone at the beginning of the movie, practicing her act, I guess. But that moves on to straight up, looking into the camera lens, breaking the fourth wall, talking to the viewer very quickly. And this wore out is welcome, and unfortunately, it runs through the entire film. This story is about one particular writer in Emerson's Cab, played by Richard Spate Jr. You know, that guy from that movie or that TV show that you can't think of the name of. He requires multiple stops, and as he does stop, he comes back and he's closer to preventing a demon apocalypse that happens at midnight. But we never really leave the cab, so most of the action is off camera. This leaves the viewer to wonder whether it's happening or not, along with Dillard herself. But really, the focus is all on Dillard. That's what she wants us to care about. She wants us to f focus on whether she gets back together with her girlfriend or has the nerve to get on stage and be a stand-up comedian. It all felt sort of like a vanity project, as the whole movie hinges on Dillard, her face, and the plight which all centers around her. Because I found the character so annoying, liking a movie centering around that character was really hard to get into. Let's move on to the luring and whoo doggy, this one makes the rest of the films covered this week look like Oscar contenders. The luring reaches the room-like awkwardness as it tries to tell the story of Garrett, played by Rick Irwin and his poofy Rick Springfield hair, who is missing a chunk of memory from his youth where he stayed in a cabin in Vermont with his family during his birthday. Garrett and his clingy girlfriend Claire, played by Michaela Sprague, go back to the cabin in hopes to shake loose his memories. On the first night, Garrett is visited by a girl from his past, and though Garrett doesn't remember her, he's intrigued by her, so much that he decides to break things off with Claire. It seems the cabin itself is somewhat haunted, or at least that's what I thought was going on. The film moves on as more of a collection of scenes rather than an actual story. There doesn't seem to be a lot of thought put into making this Descent into Madness story make sense from one scene to the next. Random stuff happens. Like, all of a sudden, with about 20 minutes left in the film, a clown on stilts is introduced, out of the blue, for a scene. And then he disappears. I think filmmaker Christopher Wells is going for an experimental, sort of David Lynch-like surreal take on The Shining, but it comes off simply as amateur. There really are no characters to like or sympathize with. Michaela Sprague is the best thing about this film, but she plays a spineless character, so it's tough sympathizing with her. Garrett is a complete egotistical asshole to everyone, especially Claire, and I ended up hating him by the end of the movie. Speaking of the end, there really isn't any. Just more attempts at making this feel deep when there really is no depth at all. They keep on going back to the scene of a floating red balloon, and I didn't even think this was scary when it was so prevalent in It. It certainly isn't very scary here. The Luring is a train wreck of a film, and if you like that sort of thing, go for it. But it lacks scares or character. It only jumbles scenes together ineptly and tries to call it art. Let's chug on through with Russell Massacre, a well-intentioned mess of a movie by Killer Campout director Brad Twig about a groundskeeper named Randy, Richie Alcevedo, 
who takes abuse from his boss, his job, his peers, and pretty much the entire world until he snaps and decides to go all George the Animal Steel on everyone in his path, leaving bloody, gory heaps of people parts in its wake. This sounds like it would be a really awesome movie. And I'm glad all of these former professional wrestlers got some work and were able to do some wrestling moves in someone's backyard for an afternoon. But this is a rough film to sit through. Twig was able to deliver some schlocky fun in Killer Campout, but it seems he might have either been too infatuated with wrestling or maybe intimidated by working with some of these wrestling icons to get any kind of decent performance from them. I haven't followed wrestling since the early 90s, but if I learned anything from the dark side of the ring, it's that wrestlers are not the easiest people to work with. So maybe Twig had some trouble getting some of them to do a second take. Sure, it's cool to see Nikolai Volkov, Tony Atlas, and Jimmy Valiant again. And I'm sure if you're into wrestling, you'll recognize a few more of these characters. But this one is full to the brim with bad acting, a meandering narrative, and motivationalist characters. Sure, this one is nice and gory, as Alcevedo seems pretty good at tearing through bodies and doing some wrestling moves. It's full of gratuitous nudity as well, and if that's all you need, Wrestle Massacre delivers in spades. But there's barely a story at all threading this one together. Bone Box was quietly released on Shudder last week, and after watching it, I sort of understand why. The film's got a decent premise. A grave robber nabs some gold trinkets from some newly buried caskets to pay off gambling debts, and finds himself haunted by the owners of said trinkets. There are decent attempts at creative camera work and moody scares from director Luke Genton. I especially like the long takes the film has, which do amp up the tension a bit from time to time. Unfortunately, actor Gareth Corzin just doesn't seem to have the range to cover the amount of emotions required for the role of Tom, our lead character. He's surrounded by some talented actors, most notably Maria Olsen, who always goes above and beyond in her roles, and does so here as Tom's elderly aunt, though the actress isn't nearly as old as she is playing. I think if another actor led this film, I'd have liked it a whole lot more, but unfortunately the camera follows Corzin from the beginning to end, and many of the scenes that could have been bone-chilling simply aren't because of the way Tom reacts to them. There's also a swipe scare straight from the night gallery pilot, which fails to land because of the acting as well. But it was fun to see that sort of callback. This one is as close to a near hit as it comes so far this week. Feeling pretty defeated from sitting through this week's indie offerings, I decided to look into the Kings of Horror Network for something that would relight my love for low-budget goodness. And sure enough, I found an awesome film with an American terror. Covering some highly controversial subject matter, that of school bullying and school shootings, director-writer Haler Garcia offers up a thrilling and twisted little take about a group of outcasts who decide they've taken enough crap from their schoolmates. When they set out to steal some guns from a local junk man, they have no idea what kind of hell they are stepping into when they realize this junk man is a bona fide lunatic. I know empathizing with kids who are about to shoot up a school isn't going to be a popular subject, but compared to this man monster, they're practically angels. Though the cast is made up of people you haven't heard of, they're all rock solid, especially Graham Emmons, who plays one of the bullied kids with a quiet, seething feel. Louise McDonald is also quite good as one of the cheerleaders who is sympathetic towards the trio of outcasts. And that's none other than Cobra's Brian Thompson as the Junkman. I love the design of the Junkman, wearing a pestilence mask and a vest with multiple severed arms attached to it. This is a memorable slasher that takes the film to a whole other level of sickness and perversion. As the kids try to get out of the Junkman's lair, the countdown for the school dance is on. Garcia has set up a pretty good moral conundrum here, as if these kids you've come to care about escape the junk man, then the school gets shot up. If not, the junk man gets another victory. This is a dark, dark film that will resonate long after you've watched it, and I highly recommend you watch An American Terror right after you finish this one on Kings of Horror. That'll be it for this week's Low Budget Binge. I'm glad I was able to find at least one film to recommend out of the bunch. If you dig what you just watched, hit that like button. Don't forget to share the video with your friends across social media. Look for written reviews and countdowns at mlmillerwrites.com. And be sure to subscribe and hit the bell for notifications so you never miss an episode of ML Miller Frights. Thanks again for watching and take care. There he goes. Come on.
Stuck inside your reality